Before we became hosts of this podcast, we were successful personal trainers. Today's episode, we're gonna talk about how to be a six-figure trainer consistently, build a career doing something you love. Some of us were successful. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> we Which one was it? I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> We were all pretty successful. Yeah, I think we, we, did all right. we, were, we were all right. We did all right. We did all right. No, so true. let's let's start with the statistics. Um, we made hundreds uh, of dollars. Yeah, lots, the, lots of hundos. The the average trainer in uh, in America. So the average trainer in America. What will is make it? What is it? What is it now? Sixty. Is it sixty? About, about sixty grand a year. Did you did you search that? Before? I did. Oh, okay. I did. So some states the average is in the high forties. I think uh, Washington was the highest at seventy, but the average is around sixty. Interesting. Washington was the highest. Yeah. I know. Isn't that interesting? That is interesting. Yeah. Now, the, the, the thing about this, though, is this is a little misleading because this is the average trainer that sticks around and doesn't quit. Uh, the personal training industry has a tremendously high, high turnover, turnover rate. Yeah. Very, if you counted the turnover, this number would be way lower. Oh, yeah. If you, if you average those people and what the, the amount of money they made before they exited, yes. it would be really bad. Really low. It's, it's probably one of the highest turnover um, careers uh, that, that exist. And, and a lot of that is because it's hard. Yep. It's a tough thing to do. A lot of people have a passion for fitness, get into it, and they just, they're just not trained properly themselves. They're not coached on how to build a business properly. And as a result, they get in and all the passion in the world uh, starts to fizzle when you can't support yourself and your family. Mm -hmm. um, and then you end up doing something else. I mean, there's a lot of people I know who are grown adults now who at one point tried to become trainers and just, and just couldn't make it. Um, so that 60 K it's not a lot, even the average that, that sticks around isn't a lot. Um, uh, but it's, it's lower than that. And I'll, I'll say this, I can pretty confidently say if you're, if you have integrity, you're somewhat competent, um, six figure as a trainer is realistic. Yeah. Uh, I'm, this isn't one of those seven figure, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, podcasts. Uh, this is realistic. I think if you do a good job. And you do the things we talk about here consistently. You'll, you'll make six figures consistently as, as a personal trainer. I was trying to think of like any trainer I knew that was like part time, you know, training, but then also like successfully uh, that hadn't already started a hundred percent investing in like immersed themselves as a personal trainer, built a, a business, and then went on to another career and then still did it on the side. Yeah. There's no other. I, I just don't know if that's possible mm -hmm. to, you know, some people have the idea that I like the gym and I like, and I'm passionate about helping people. And I wonder, I wonder if I could do this part time. No, I don't think it's possible. My favorite part about communicating this. And, and I think we've been really consistent for 10 years when we talk about this subject. Um, and I always love it when we, we hear these people that call in and they're like, Hey, I, you know, I became a personal trainer behind you guys. Cause we always kind of like chuckle off air and be like, it's crazy. These people become trainers and we tell them how fucking hard it is. There's yeah. no money in it. <laughs> like, yeah. but I, I, I think that in, in this day and age of social media uh, and instant gratification and the you know, marketing ability is there's a lot of hype and there's a lot of businesses that sell, sell coaches and trainers, especially now that there's, you know, online coaching is a thing that was never even a thing, say a decade and a half ago uh, that sell you on this idea of how to make 10 grand a month and, you know, how to, how to make seven figures. And it's just like, We've never presented that information that way because we know how unrealistic that is for the average person. It is a hard profession. There is high turnover. Um, it is a grind to get to even six figures. It's a grind to get to that. And it's going to take you at least a couple years probably to reach six figures. Maybe in a year, if you're really, really good, you could get there. Um, if you're really ambitious, you really are high skilled and you're really growth minded, you can reach that one. But most don't. Most don't reach that number. Um, but if you're passionate about helping people, you love the industry, you don't count hours outside of you getting paid as hours working towards your craft or whatever you're, then you have a chance to, to do well at this. The cool part is that we've been doing this for such a long time. Um, a lot of us have, have learned uh, a lot of the, the uh, mistakes um, and the, 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 must, the must do's, the must don'ts. And I think that's really how we've always communicated this to the average person that might be considering being a personal trainer. And I'm I'm just as excited as you guys are of finally, after 10 years, really uh, diving into this side of the business of helping coaches and trainers. And the number one thing 
that I hear from all of our trainers that go through our co our course is you guys communicate this so different than anybody else on the internet that and they most people by the way that have our course have paid for other courses and done things for people and most of those are structured in a way to show a quick return on their investment so you spend 5 grand with me and I'll show you how to make 10 grand a month and the the gimmick is to show you a quick way to hack the system on Instagram or hustle a challenge together to get get the money that you paid me back so you can then turn around and say, well, you know, I paid Adam five grand and he did show me how to make 10 grand in one month. You only make 10 grand that one month, you never make it again done. and you're done. There's no career. Uh, but there's it's not building a career. It's not making you a great trainer. And we're just not in the business that, nor do we, that, it's not what we no. want to uh, position this as. Our job or our goal is to try and make really good trainers that impact a lot of lives. Now, here's the deal. Um, it is an extremely rewarding career. I mean, it really is. It's it's one of the most rewarding things I've ever done to actually take and work with people and help them really in fundamental ways improve their lives. Like if you take anybody, you take anybody who isn't fit, it doesn't have good health, uh, the typical average person who's sedentary and whatever. If you take that person and you make them fit, you get to the point where they want to be fit, they can do it on their own, you get them to become more healthy, their entire life has changed. Everything about what they do, from their work, to mm -hmm. being a parent, to being a spouse, to being a friend, their sleep, their sex life, their energy, everything improves. It's actually one of the most powerfully impactful things uh, that somebody can experience. And you get to be a part of this, and you get to watch this and guide people along with this. And it's so rewarding. It's it's yeah. it's one it's Very one of the most satisfying. It's one of the most purpose driven things that I think uh, that I know I've ever done. And I'm a father, and that's that's at the top. But this is pretty darn close. Is working with people and, and doing that. There's you know there's also a myth around uh, training where you could do it, but it's unstable and it's not a career that's consistent. That's so not true. It's so not true. If you do it right, and it's not. By the way, we're not gonna. It's not like this crazy secrets. We're going to talk about some stuff that a lot of trainers make mistakes on that if you follow and you follow our advice and you're consistent with it, the odds are you're going to be able to do this. Mm. Uh, if you're somewhat competent, you will be able to do this. And then it's consistent. This episode is brought to you by Viore Clothing. Go through our link, get 20% off. All right, back to the show. I mean, I trained people uh, for, I mean, as a, as a personal trainer for 15 years, as a manager longer, but even training my own clients, and many of those clients were with me for years and years and years. It was consistent. It's like I showed up, I trained my clients, I went home. I didn't have this up and down type of business that some people think uh, training involves. It was a very rewarding, satisfying uh, career. And, when, and one of the reasons why we're so passionate about it, number one, is we're trainers ourselves at heart. But number two, the trainers are the ones that really make the big difference. They're the ones that really make the impact. They're the ones that drive the fitness industry in real ways, right? So there's the marketing of the fitness industry and supplements and all this other stuff. But if you really boil it down, like who's really improving their health and able to maintain it? Who's really making those changes? It's largely people who work with excellent coaches and trainers. So we're really passionate about this because it can make a huge difference. And there's a very big gap. There's a huge gap between trainers that have figured this out and everybody else. And that's what we're going to talk about is what is it about those trainers that figured it out? And can it be duplicatable? Absolutely. It's absolutely duplicatable. I do think that it it mirrors probably most other industries yeah. in the fact that, like many things, um, there's a learning curve. It's tough at the beginning. Um, you probably don't make a lot of money. You're not an expert at that point. But over time, um, you get experience. You get better at your craft. You continue to chase mastery, continue to change lives and help people. You learn. You fall down. You get back up. And it gets easier and easier. Um, the difference of what the first year of uh, my career of, of building my portfolio of clients compared to <clears throat> years five, six, and seven w was completely different. Yeah. Once you've established yourself and you build a reputation uh, around being a very good coach, a very good trainer, somebody who gets people's results, people, a trainer that's likable, that people like showing up to, when you once you start to build that reputation – uh, the job just gets easier and easier. Yes. And and then that's when it gets really fun. When you get comfortable in it, mm -hmm. you make it through that learning phase of your career and you're good at your craft, uh, like many things, it's it's fun. And it can be very rewarding. And it can be financially rewarding too. It's just, it's a myth to think that 
it's an overnight success. And because we have these anomalies uh, on social media where somebody gets uh, famous overnight because of their body or because they're on a cover of a magazine or they know somebody or they're, they're funny online. And so they have a million followers and because they have a million followers, they could write any sort of a digital program and they can make a few hundred thousand dollars. You have all these people that are trying to emulate that. And that is such a failing strategy. Even that person who got millions of followers and made a few hundred thousand dollars selling digital programs, they still didn't go it's, through the proper steps of becoming a great trainer. And it's a fleeting business. Yeah, and it's like it's yeah. like trying to be a, a doctor, but being one on Grey's Anatomy instead of a real doctor. Right. We're, we're, this is about real coaches, real trainers. And look, I don't know any six-figure career that is overnight. Okay, no. this doesn't exist. You got to put the work in. Yes. I mean, and that's like, we're not going to brush over that and just give you hacks. No, uh, it doesn't and, work that way. No, we have to just reiterate the fact that it's going to take work. It's going to take time. But, you know, the, the beautiful thing is, is that education, I think, has really transformed, um, you know, the approach or the, the um, uh, what am I trying to say? The landscape of the whole Yeah, thing. just like, you know, the ability you have now to really like um, – compress like and, and not make those same mistakes and be able to you oh, know stay, time stay oh, focused yeah. and shorten the yeah. time length that will take you to, to achieve no, mastery you're 100 so right. i mean podcasts here you have like a lot of free information that we never had you know coming through it but so you know take advantage of that but at the same time as you're doing that you have to put the work in you have to put the time in you got to show face you have to you know trial and error and work with with these clients to figure this out yeah. all right so the first thing is and, and adam mentioned it earlier is you need to be very very passionate about people. Now you thought I was going to say fitness, right? Uh, obviously you like fitness, but this is not a fitness job. This is a people job. Yeah. Fitness is your expertise and your modality, but this is far more a people job or a person career or a career based on people than it is based on <clears throat> fitness. And that's a 100% fact. You could be the most knowledgeable, knowledgeable trainer in the world, like no nutrition, no exercise, no technique, no programming inside and out and be a terrible people person and you'll have zero success. Yeah. On the flip side, you can be a total novice with diet, a total novice with exercise technique and programming, but be an excellent people person and you're going to do okay. So this is what you're working with every single day. You're working with people. Now, why is it so important to be passionate about people when you do this? Well, besides the obvious that you're working with people, you are going to be sh working with people every day and they're going to show up every day and they're not going to do what you tell them every day. I mean, they're going to show up every single day. You're going to help coach them and they're not going to do what you tell them because this is hard. This is very hard. Getting somebody from un out of shape and unhealthy to fit and healthy for the rest of their life is a long process. You're also going to deal with different personalities. You're going to deal with some introverts and extroverts and business people and at-home people. You're going to deal with older people and younger people, people with pain, people for fat loss, muscle gain, motivated people, loud people, quiet people, all kinds of different individuals from different backgrounds with different goals. And if you don't just love people in general, you're going to have a very, and this job will suck because every hour you're going to be with somebody the entire time. This job will suck if you don't love people. I, I love this point. And for context, you know, most of my career was actually spent not training clients one-on-one. It was actually working with coaches and trainers, right? I spent more of my career developing other trainers. So I've had a lot of trainers, hundreds of trainers that have worked for me over the course of a decade and a half. So I've had an opportunity to see a lot of different types of trainers. And it always was interesting and fascinating to me to see the super ripped trainer who had all the certs and was really smart, but then was just an asshole. <laughs> just, and nobody and just struggled. Unlikable. Yeah, unlikable. And 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 probably he thought this was a good profession because he was so passionate about fitness. And that's yeah. why I love you talking about it's not fitness that you need to be passionate about. It's people that's more important that you need to be passionate about because this trainer or these trainers I'm thinking of, boy, they were very passionate about fitness. I mean, they lived the brand. They looked the brand. They looked amazing. They lo they were constantly reading and learning all about stuff that was related to fitness, but they were just a prick. Mm -hmm. And they were just somebody who you didn't like to be around. And they struggled so much to have a successful career in personal training. And so, and then I would have the, uh, the kid, the kid who, had, you know, looked all right you know he looked healthy and fit but he didn't look ripped he wasn't like impressive he didn't have a degree yet he didn't have all kinds of experience in national service but boy he was just he was likable mm -hmm. and he and he liked people and he could be a chameleon and he was he could accept somebody with different political views and different religious views and he could talk to the 60 year old lady and then turn around and talk to the 12 year old kid that is the, and i 
I always knew this about myself. I didn't know that this would translate into the career. I think this is part of my journey of realizing how much I love this job. I always liked people. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we've shared, if you've listened to this podcast for a long time, when we talk about our personal stories, uh, when I was in high school, um, I was I was friends with kind of everybody. I had skater friends, stoner friends, athlete friends, nerdy friends. Like I kind of hung out with everybody. I had friends in all the cliques. And I, I think I genuinely just liked all people. And I really liked people for their character. And I didn't I didn't fall in the things of like cliques and groups. And and so I think it's just because I've always been intrigued by people in general. I didn't realize how much that would translate into a superpower in personal training because that's so much of personal training yes. because and people will feel that energy when they show up to their appointment with you. And if you're the type of person who just because someone has a different political view than you or have a different religious view than you or sees the world socially different than you, that you can't enjoy the conversation in them. You can't enjoy getting to know them because they're going to express yeah. their opinions and views. Yes. And if you're not, they are. <laughs> yeah. And if you're look it, what this does automatically, first off, it makes you likable when you have, when someone's passionate about people, then when people are around them, I mean, imagine being around someone that's curious about you, that's yeah. passionate about your life and what you're doing and is interested and is curious and is just likes to talk to you. Like you're going to like them. That's what this is all about. And by the way, this has to be genuine. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, in two days, Adam and I are teaching trainers and coaches how to retain their clients during the holiday season. It's a free webinar, absolutely free. Sign up at trainerwebinar.com or click on this. All right, back to the show. There, look, there's a lot of jobs that you you do your job, but then you get breaks. And you, when you're training people, there is no break. You have a client for one hour, that entire hour you're you are on. on. Another person comes in, you are on for another hour. Another person in, you are on for an hour. You cannot fake being passionate for people because eventually it's going to come out. So this has to be something genuine about yourself. And what I'm doing with this first one is weeding out the people this is not genuine. You can't yeah. learn this, in my opinion. No, no. I think you, you have, have it or you, you don't. You have the yes. personality of a lab scientist or like an engineer <laughs> or like an accountant or somebody that's just like, I just want to focus on the numbers and this. And like, this is just not the career for you. You need to know this and, you know, to give people some uh, ways to, to learn this about themselves or, you know, can you apply this? I remember when I would get somebody who was on the total opposite aisle politically, socially, religiously, any of these areas that tend to be really touchy mm -hmm. subjects for people. And I was genuinely curious if somebody I did not agree with or I did not see eye to eye with in a topic, instead of me shying away from that topic because I'm like, oh God, I disagree with her or him and I don't want to bring that up because it's going to get awkward because I don't, I think this way and they think that way, I would actually, I would go in. And I would ask more questions. And then if they said things like, oh, do you do you agree with that? I'd be like, no, actually, I'm on the other side, but I'm so curious to what yeah. makes... And, it, and if you come off that way, where you're genuinely curious about why they think differently than you, and you yeah. want, and you approach it with the, I want to learn, I want to understand how why somebody else would think different about mm -hmm. these ways. I know how I was raised. I know mm -hmm. what I was taught. I know why I think this way. This person thinks totally opposite. Instead of me putting up a wall or trying to avoid those conversations, I would go towards them. And I enjoyed that. I enjoyed being challenged with my own ideology. I don't know how many times in my 20 years <laughs> that I changed my views on yeah. things because I was raised a certain way. I was taught a certain way. I thought that was the right way. And then somebody else who was far more intelligent than me said the opposite argument. And I actually went into listening. I thought, man, that's a really good point. I've never thought of it that way. Yeah. Uh, you have to want to do that. And, and, and people know this. They can feel it. And, you know, it's it's you also look forward, you know, at some, there was, there was a point in my career later on when I started to feel guilty, uh, for, for charging people to train them because I looked so forward to, to asking them questions. I'd have a surgeon come in who's my client. It's like, mm -hmm. Oh my God, I can't wait to see so-and-so I'm going to ask them all these questions or whatever. And someone else would come in who's been married for 40 years. Oh, I can't wait to ask them again about their marriage or what was it like in this area when, you know, when they were growing up or what it's like to live from in this other country. Like I look forward to seeing these people because I genuinely like, like people and people know that and they feel that this makes you so likable. And this is why this is so important. Uh, it makes you more effective as a trainer. It makes you more likable and it makes people want to show up to see you because I hate to break this to you. Uh, if you're trying to become a trainer or a coach right now, people are not going to show up for you week in and week out, year in and year out because they love fitness. It's not going to happen no, for no. fitness. They show for you. They're going to show up for you. That's how they keep coming. It's because they like you. All right. Next, uh, you have to become a master 
of sales. Now, this is a dirty word for trainers and coaches. Every time I had a new trainer work for me and I would talk about sales, I would see their face like, what? Sales. I hate sales. I hate, I just want to help people. Look, let me, I'm going to break the news to you here. I'm not just talking about selling your services. When you're a trainer or a coach, you know what you do every sell, time you train a sell client? Sell your ideas. You have to sell them on changing their minds and their ideas and their behaviors. You're constantly selling them on why they need to start exercising a particular way, why they need to change their diet, why they need to look at this when it comes to sleep. You have to become a master of sales. And of course, yes, you also have to learn how to sell your services. And sales skills, which, which I like to refer to as effective communication skills, these skills are going to serve you tremendously as a personal trainer. It makes you more successful just as a coach or trainer. And of course, it makes you much more, more successful at selling your products and your services. Yeah, I, I would make the case that it's the most important thing because of what you just said. Because I think that's the, the, the disconnect that trainers would have is when they hear the word sales, they think of just the, the selling the money part and the getting the credit card and the making people yes. write you a check. And that's the, they think of it as this dirty word. But when you understand and you, you, you know that you understand that sales is all it is, is effective communication. And that a huge part of your job is somebody hired you who is out of shape and unhealthy, which means they have created behaviors and habits in their life that have give them that outcome. They did not get fat that way overnight. They did not get that way with all of a sudden one bad decision. They have created habits and behaviors in their life that has led to that. And it is your job to help them change that. And you better be fucking good at yeah. selling them on those ideas. Because if you cannot convince them to change those behaviors, to change those habits, to want to change those things, you're never going to get them the results that they're paying you to do. So that is step one of being a good trainer. And then once you learn to do that and you deliver on the product, then guess what? There comes a time when they run out of their 10 sessions and you got to renew them. And so being able to do that is an important point. So this trait is so important. In fact, I'd say most of my time as a leader of trainers. This is what you were teaching. Was what I was teaching. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because most trainers get in because they like people, they're passionate about fitness, they understand exercise physiology or nutrition. That's pretty easy to find. I mean, I, it, obviously you get a bias if you're applying to be a trainer, you probably have those things. And so that's not hard to find uh, with any trainer. But what is hard to find or hard to teach is getting that trainer to understand how important the ability oh. to sell is. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole time you're painting the vision every single session and you're getting them on board with the plan that you're executing. And it's no different than we're just like continuing the plan I've been talking about this entire time. It's just, you know, in order for this to keep happening, you got to, you know, we, we have to be funded. We have to, you know, and that's a, that's a respect thing, too. Like one thing I learned when I was uh, uh, when I was in the restaurant business and I thought, First of all, I was going to get better tips because I was like, I would go to the manager and I would get them to like put a discount on, you know, the appetizer. I would get their drinks for free. I would get all this. I'd try and like lower the price point on their overall uh, meal. And I thought, oh, it's going to get me great tips. Terrible tips. <laughs> yeah, it, it that's not what people go to restaurants for. They go for the experience. They want to know what's the best. And then I present them the best. And then I show them the best. And they thank me later when the bill's like double what it was to begin <laughs> with. And it's it tripped me out. But, that it's, but it makes sense to me because if I'm in here, I want a professional leading me towards the goal, keeping me on track, and they want to trust you and believe in what you have to say. Which means you have to sell it. You have to sell it. Which means you absolutely have to sell it. No, if I were to inherit, if I had a gym right now and I had 30 brand new trainers with, that just started working for me, and I was able to invest in one course for them, it would be a sales course. It wouldn't be a personal training certification course. It wouldn't. Those are all valuable. I'm not saying they're not valuable. But if I had a bunch of new trainers, for sure, and I could pick a sales course, that's what I would put them in because it would give them the most return um, on their business. All right, next, you have to become a master of coaching. So training people is not checkers. It's chess, okay? Mm -hmm. It's the long game. So we talk about selling them on how to change behaviors. This is a long sales process. You are not going to get Susie or Mark or Mr. Johnson to lose 30 pounds in 60 days and then figure it out for the rest of our life just like that. It ain't going to happen. These are habits that have been built over long periods of time. They're ingrained 
What you eat isn't just food. It's also emotions and celebrations and culture, lots of different things. Your activity, I mean, that's a part of your life. This is what I do on a daily basis. Um, how am I going to get this person over time to slowly move to becoming somebody who wants to exercise and eat right forever and ever and ever? And this means you have to become a master of coaching. One of the biggest mistakes that trainers make, new trainers make, is they'll take, and this is how you know that they don't understand coaching. They'll take a new client. The client will give them the goal. Uh, uh, I want to lose 30 pounds. No problem. And then they'll give them everything they need to do right now. Okay, yeah. cool. Here's your diet. Here's your workout. This will totally Here's get you all that the goal. answers. Boom. This is, and then this is going to fix you right here. And I know right away when I see that, this is going to be a failing situation. A good coach, somebody who has experience who understands, knows when they come in and the client tells me, I want to lose 30 pounds in 60 days. I'm saying, no, 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 no. We're not going to lose 30 pounds in 60 days. It's going to take longer than that. Here's what it's going to look like, and we're going to start right here. I know you want to do all this, but I'm going to start you right here, and here's why. And then the sailing process, of course, goes in to the, to the process itself. But being a really good coach, you understand human behavior, and you understand behavior modification. You're patient. You're calm. You have grace with your clients when they fail, because they will, but you're also very honest, and you deliver that honesty in a way where it's not a bad impact. It's like, Oh, you're right. All right, let's do this again. The best example of this that comes to mind for me is, um, for the audience that doesn't know this, we took a, a group of 50 people through a GLP one, uh, course, right? So basically we let 50 people come into a private community where we are helping the, them go through a GLP one and coaching them weekly. Basically we get on a zoom call and we help them out with all their questions and, uh, you know, these are 50 strangers. We don't know any of these people and we're getting to know them for the first time. We also have 10 trainers that we allow to be a fly on the wall and watch us coach these 50 strangers through this whole process. The number one thing that they have given us as feedback of is, is this part right here is, man, it's so wild to watch the way you guys communicate to these people. We were just talking about this last week on our private call with these trainers that this is this part right here, this understanding behavior modification, understanding how to meet people where they're currently at, read the room, the social awareness, like this, this is the part, I, this is the part I loved about personal training. And this is the part that I really believed with, there was an art to it. There is an art to knowing what you can say at what time to a person, meaning when you have to understand that there's going to be times when you are coaching a client and you know there's stuff that they're doing that is not ideal. Maybe the way they're training, maybe the way they're dieting, maybe the way they're treating their body. And you're going, man, I inside of you wants to just jump out and be like, that's not a good idea. That's wrong. You need to stop doing this and doing that. But unfortunately, you haven't built the relationship yet. Mm -hmm. You haven't built the credibility yet. You haven't brought the wall all the way down to be able to get that person to receive that information yet. And it's probably the number one mistake I see young, young, ambitious you know, happy, positive, motivated trainers do is they, they got all this information and they're fresh out of college or they got all these certs and they're like, I got all this information. I'm going to go help all these people. And then they hear the people, what they're doing wrong. And then they tell them everything they're doing wrong. <laughs> and they don't understand Scold. why that person doesn't follow through or, or they don't show up again or doesn't show up to another employment or doesn't re-sign after the contract is over. And the reason why that is, is they, they, they haven't learned the art of the, the social awareness, reading the, the room and meeting a person where you're currently at in that relationship. This is such an important skill to harness and learn how to do because we have to first, and these people are watching us do this real time with these people where, you know, week one, we're talking to them and they're, they're, they're voicing what they're doing on the, and I know what all of us are thinking, you know, we're like, oh boy, she's got, she's really over training yeah. and oh, wow, mm -hmm. she needs to do this and she needs to, but we can't say that yet. Why? Because she just met us. And if I come out and I start telling her everything she's doing wrong, I'm going to insult her and I'm going to put a wall up right away. I have to build that trust. It's the right delivery. It's the right uh, way to to say that in order to move them towards the di desired outcome. It's it, and that's the thing you have to like consider all those factors. Uh, that's going to be the most well received and and it's going to move them closer towards your objective. Yeah. Step one is you get them to show up and want to be there. They, that has to happen. So once they're there, that's great. You don't want to compromise that because if you blow someone out the water, like I've done early in my career where I'm like, I'm going to tell you how you're messing up and here's what you got to do. And you have your come to Jesus talk or whatever. And I, you know, feel like I succeeded in telling the person what they're doing wrong. And then they didn't come back. Like I lost, right? I lost, I lost the client. They're not getting any help. So number one, they're showing up. If they're showing up, 
you have time. Number two, you have to build influence. You have to build influence with them. You have to gain their trust. And then little by little, the coaching becomes more and more effective and you're able to coach more and more. And you don't want to push too fast. You never want to push too fast. You want to bring them on right at the right speed. And again, grace is very important with coaching because your clients will fail. I've never had a client in my entire life, and I don't think there's a train in the world that exists that has a client uh, ever where the client right out the gates does everything perfect, changes their life, now they're fit forever. Never works that way. There's always a step forward, two steps back, two steps forward, one step back. It's like this constant you know, process of up, down, up, down. Um, and it's, it's, they have to feel okay with that. Your client has to feel okay coming to you to tell you, I screwed up. Here's what's happened with my diet or whatever. If they fear you or they're embarrassed or ashamed to tell their trainer, which by the way, this happens a lot. There's a lot of trainers that create a relationship with their clients where the client feels ashamed mm -hmm. to tell their trainer that they didn't do the right thing. Great. You have zero influence now. The person now is not going to tell you what's happening. Now you can't help them at all. They're hiding from you. What use is that? You have to create that environment and that relationship where you can actually work with them and influence them. And this is what we mean by becoming a master of coaching. One good way to learn this, by the way, is to, is to get a mentor. Experienced yeah. trainers are typically really good at this. And if you could work with for a trainer for free and watch them communicate with their clients, you'll learn how to do this much faster than through trial and error. Well, just one more point to that is like you got to be vulnerable and you got to be yeah. relatable. And so that's how you really pull them in um, to trust, you know, that you have their best interest in mind. And, you know, you can create stories in that regard to then, you know, help kind of paint that vision for them and get them on board. Yeah. Better. Now, uh, the next thing is to never stop learning or never stop your education in fitness. Now, there's two reasons why this is important. The first one's the obvious. You want to be up to date with your information. You want to be up to date with exercise, uh, programming, with nutrition. You want to learn different modalities. Now I can work with mobility. Now I understand correctional exercise. Now I understand uh, performance-based workouts and traditional strength training, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the obvious. But here's the second part that's less obvious. I always noticed that when my trainers took a new course, they would come back with a new excitement and motivation that always translated into better sessions with the clients, even if the information they learned wasn't something they could apply uh, to this to their clients. They it would always just keep, keep them excited. It kept them motivated because they kept learning. So this will continue to stoke your passion for fitness. And even if the information you learn isn't transferable to your client, like if you have a 74 year old client, now you just took a course on maximizing, you know, athletic performance, you're probably not gonna be able to apply much of that to your new client, but it's gonna reignite your passion for fitness and your client's gonna feel that. So two reasons why I think education should never stop. Listen, there's a saying in business that goes, uh, a business is always either growing or dying. There's no such thing as cruising along or coasting and, and just kind of maintaining. It is always growing or it is always dying. And in the business of personal training, you are that business. So if you are not constantly pursuing growth and educating and learning yourself, you are most likely going back. You are most likely dying. Your business is most likely dying. And so approaching your business, approaching your growth with that mindset of, I've got to constantly be stretching myself. I've got to be constantly educating myself. This is the way that you're going to continue to be successful as a personal trainer and grow your business. Yeah, 100%. Um, and you know, today, there's more available in terms of education than there ever was. Um, today, there's more available and free education than there was in paid in, uh, education when I was an early trainer. I mean, you could get more stuff for free now than we could ever pay for oh, yeah. when we became trainers. So this part right here is like, it's incredible. I mean, you can go on YouTube and you can learn from some of the best uh, athletic trainers in the world. You can listen to podcasts with some of the best people on nutrition, on supplements, on, you know, on, on so many different things. So this right here is easier than ever. Um, just never stop doing this because it'll keep you fresh and sharp as a trainer, as your career continues to grow. All right, lastly, uh, I'll say what it is and then we'll explain it, but figure out how many people you need to talk to every single day. Okay, so here's where that comes from, okay? Uh, one of the big mistakes or challenges that trainers run into is it they have a challenging time forecasting or predicting or understanding mm -hmm. how to hit 
a particular income on a monthly basis. Predictable income. Yeah, it typically looks like this. Like, okay, I did you know $6,000 this month. I want to make $8,000 next month, so I'm just going to try harder. But they, they don't really know what's moving the needle. They just try harder, yeah. which is not, there's nothing wrong with that. But what if you could break it down into smaller pieces so that all you need to know is how many people do I need to talk to every single day because you figured that number out? This is something that um, when I first got into management, I was only 21 years old. So at that point, I've only got a little over a year under my belt as a personal trainer. At that time, I think I only had like two national certifications. So, and obviously not a lot of experience. So I didn't bring a lot to the table when it came to uh, physiology, nutrition, exercise science. That was not, that wasn't my forte, but I was always passionate about business. And I was, I've been an entrepreneur since I was a kid, a very young, young kid starting his business all the way back in high school. And so I've always been passionate about that. And one of the things that I understood was like how to break down like my business all the way down to tactical daily goals and things to do. And when I got into the fitness business, it was one of the eight things that I saw lacking. Like Everybody was talking about being a better coach when it came to program design. Everybody talked about exercise and stretching and nutrition. And like there was so much effort into the science of being a great coach and trainer, but very little conversation was being had around the business of it. And so I leaned heavily in this direction because it's like, okay, here's where I can help my team. Um, a lot of my team is more experienced, more knowledgeable than me. I'm not going to teach them about nutrition and, and exercise science, but I could teach them more about business. And so all of my trainers, when we would sit down and go over their monthly goals and I would ask them, how much money do you want to make this month? And I would let them throw those arbitrary numbers out that Sal just said, I want to make six grand. I want to make eight grand. Then I would go, okay, well, how are you going to do that? I'm just going to try harder or I'm going to talk to more people. Well, how many people? What does that look like? And it was really great that, you know, I worked for a big company that tracked a lot of these analytics. So I could actually sit down with a trainer and say, okay, it looks like Steve, when you walk out and you talk to 10 people on the floor, you can book nine of those people for a free appointment. You're pretty good at convincing those people to come see you for a free appointment. Those nine people that show up for a free appointment, half of those people end up actually show, or showing up. Of those half of those people that actually show up, two of those people actually invest and buy in personal training you at an average dollar amount of 250 and so, of course, I just threw out all these random numbers, but you have the ability as a coach and trainer to track that for yourself. Once you've tracked that for yourself and you know how many people you have to talk to to try and convince to come see you for free, to how many of those people show up, to how many of those people enroll with you, you now have the analytics you need to be able to reverse engineer out whatever dollar amount you want. So if you want to make $100,000, how many people do you have to talk to? And then you break that down by the month, by the goal, by, or by the week, by the day. And instead of saying, oh, I'm going to try and make $6,000 this month, you go, oh, I need to talk to 75 people this month. If I talk to 75 people and try and book 75 people on a free appointment with me, that will translate to $8,000. And this is so important to knowing this. And when we used to tour around to all these gyms that we'd go around and do free talks to, this is always the first question when I get up on stage and I ask, I always ask trainers, What's your show percentage? What's your closing percentage? What's your average dollar you sell? And never does anyone ever raise their hand and can tell me those numbers. And I always tell these trainers that this is the first mistake you're making. If you have a goal and you're showing up to a webinar or you're listening to a podcast that's telling you how to make six figures and you can't tell me those analytics because you've never tracked that, you're running blind. And you're not, you're not breaking it down to simplify it to how many people I need to talk to per day. And once you do that, it's very easy to reverse engineer how much money it's you want to no make. It's no different than yeah. tracking your macros when you're trying to figure out why, yes, if you're gaining or losing body that. fat. Same thing. Yep. Got some questions here. Okay. How long does it take for mastery? Oh, you know. I like the 10,000 hours. Yeah. Now. You know, I think as a trainer. You have to be generic. I'm trying yeah, to think right. of a trainer. Like, how long would a trainer have to be a trainer? Before so they said, like, so in our in our field, uh, it was 5,000 training sessions before you became a master mm. trainer. That was what we, mm. so we used to give, we used to give away that 
that badge of honor. What does that look like on a, how, how many years would that take? Oh, 5,000 hours of training is a lot. Think about if you're averaging 40 a week, do the math. Yeah. So four, which is a lot, by the way, 40 yeah. clients a week or 40 hours. So that's of, like three years, two and a half years, mm -hmm. three years. Of, of full time. Of full time. Yeah. Which is most likely I would, I would five agree or seven years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that because yeah. I was about to say probably around five years. I yeah. would say if somebody yeah. was really- Somebody could string that out to five years. Yeah, if yeah. someone was really pursuing this and learning and trying to do a good job and they want to make this a career, I would say five years of experience, like, okay, now you're- and it, you're, 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 you're one of the, you're like a really good trainer. And this is why I like the 10,000 hours to mastery point is because that's 5,000 hours of training in person, which means if you're any good at your job, you've spent probably each one of those hours, you're spending time outside of that researching, yep. learning. Yep. So you're probably racked not up. not even counting that. Yeah. You're, you're not counting that. So you're probably racked up 10,000 hours on your craft. Yeah. So Chasing mastery, the 10,000 hour mark, which I know is a generic number, but I think it's a really good one, is pretty accurate when you think about yeah. it. Because if you've put 5,000 hours into clients and you've done your due diligence of reading your certifications and learning about the new science, yeah. you've probably spent 5,000 hours of reading and doing things outside of that. So that's a good number is to, is to chase that. I mean, I know, like, I've thought about this. I know I have a son that's only five years old, but this will be something that we talk about in whatever he becomes passionate about, yeah. whether it's in sports, whether it's in business. It's like, you want to become a master at this, son? We got to put 10,000 hours and we start keeping track of that right now. How many clients is considered full-time? Right, this is a good question because most jobs, 40 hours a week is considered full-time. But for personal training, it's more like 30, okay? Yeah. 30 to 35. 40 sessions a week is, now I did it. I did more than that, but it's a lot, right? Yeah, that's full, full-time. You are on, right? Remember, there's no, if you go 40 hours a week at a regular job, you're not really working 40 hours, let's be honest. There's a lot yeah, of- you farting around. Yeah, there's a lot of like downtime. When you're training 40 sessions a week, that means there's- at 40 hours where someone is standing in front of you you're and you're training them you're and you're working them. And that's not including for every client that you train, you're spending time with their paperwork, their paperwork, yeah. their nutrition and their diet, their programming. Prepping for the next So, day. yeah. So if you're, it's more like 25 to 30 hours a week is considered full-time personal training because you're putting another five to 10 hours minimum yeah in client folders just to keep them updated. So if you're most wrong, gyms are like 30, I think 30 is what they say full time is right. Well, for, that's for, yeah, legally when they have to pay taxes on it. That's exactly is that what it is. Yeah. It's 30. So once you, <laughs> yeah, so that's exactly what it is, keep is, them, is yeah. 30. But yeah. I would argue that even, yeah, even 25 good. hours uh, a week of training actual clients is and close you do to, a good job. You're doing pretty good. Yeah. It's 40 hours good. of a week. And but, if you're but cranking. You, yeah. Cause 40 sessions or 40 hours a week. It also, here's the other thing about it. It doesn't, it's not nine to five usually your clients, you have a block in the morning, a block at night. You're training 40 hours a week. You're at the gym all day. 10, 12 hours. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's, so, so it's like, yeah, 25 to 30 was probably full time. It's early access to black Friday, all maps, programs, all bundles, 60% off. Also, if you get a bundle, you'll get 10 entries to win. If you buy a program, you'll get five entries to win everything else. One entry to win five days at the mind pump house in park city. It's got a gym, it's got a cold dip. It's got a sauna. It's got red light therapy. It's all kinds of great stuff. Five day vacation hooked up with a thousand dollars for travel accommodations as well. Early access Black Friday. Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code Black Friday for the sixty percent off and the entries to win uh, a vacation at the Mind Pump Park City House. All right, back to the show. Is it best to start in a big box or private gym? Hands down, big box. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's no yeah. question about it for a couple different reasons. The <clears throat> biggest one is you have a big gym of leads all the time. Like the hardest thing about building a career as a personal training is getting clients. Yeah. You work in a big box, the clients are out in the gym. I used to do this with, my, with new trainers all the time. I'd get these trainers and I'd start talking about, about getting clients and then I'll be like, oh my God, this is so hard. And then I would do this challenge and say, okay, I'm going to go out there right now. I'm going to get a new client in 30 minutes. And I would do it uh, almost every single time. It was a way to flex, but really it was to show them like there's people on the floor all the time that could use personal training. So that's one. The second is big box gyms typically have systems in place that you can learn from that you might not have learned on your own. Things like uh, paperwork and how to track sessions and how to, you know, mm -hmm. uh, systems in terms of no shows and et cetera, et cetera. Big box gyms just have a larger, uh, they, they have more money invested 
in these kinds of things. So it's a great place to learn. I, I think it's crazy that this is ever even a question. Yeah, it's, it's undebatable. It, it is. It's undebatable in so in so many ways. Um, to the point you made, like one of the hardest things when you become a trainer, and let's just pretend you've put all the work into being brilliant. You're great at your craft. Having people in front of you is hard. Mm -hmm. It's hard to, and it is a huge luxury to have a big box gym that averages a thousand to three thousand workouts. That's a thousand to three thousand people coming through the door where you're you're stationed at, coming in front of you. That also, by the way, are also a bias, right? They're all people trying to get in shape. So it's not even like like you could go walk in the mall and go see two thousand people, but of those two thousand people, how many of them even care about fitness or trying to work out? Right? Probably a very small percentage. There is nowhere in the world you're probably going to find that many people that consistently that are your potential leads. And that is a huge luxury when you are trying to build your business. And then the other thing, let's pretend that you want one day to build your own gym or have your own private business. That big box gym at one point was a small brand. It was probably one gym at one time and it got scaled to tens to hundreds. To, and they did that through good systems, through yeah. good business practices. And you have the ability to learn that from there. That is such a, I mean, that I credit much of my success in the business space because I had the luxury of working for a billion dollar fitness company. And that was such a luxury because that company figured out at one point that company had one gym and one guy started it yep. and built it all the way up to 400 plus clubs and worth billions of dollars. Yep. And what it took to do that are in all kinds of incredible business practices that I got a front row seat of. And you know how much that has served me in business later on. So the idea that not working for a big box gym is not the best idea. It's crazy to me. Yeah, it's systems, it's marketing, it's sales, it's timing, uh, it's professionalism. It's it's all that in a really condensed environment. And, you know, bear with me, but like I thought of this analogy of like, if I'm going to learn how to fish and I go to a trout farm and I have everything, all the tools and everything, I can tinker around. I'm going to see almost within a few minutes if I'm successful or not. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, versus like me going out into the ocean and reps. who the hell knows. Yeah. It's yeah. reps. You know, you're also you're also going to be working with a lot of other trainers in a private studio, not so many. Working with a lot of trainers is great. It's great to learn from other trainers. It's great to see how other trainers uh, are becoming successful or not becoming successful. You also have a wide variety of potential clients and you need a lot of reps as a new trainer. You do. You need to train a lot of people. By the way, get this out of your mind. Uh, if you are a new trainer, you're like, I'm only going to train this kind of client. <laughs> Forget it. it. Right out in the very be that's that's when you're like, let it reveal itself to you. That's like year like it's like year ten when you're really kicking ass. But in the beginning, you train everybody, and big box gyms give you that opportunity to train lots of people. You get lots of reps to become better on someone else's dime. Yes, it's true they take a large percentage. Uh, that, of what you'll make per session. That's what's alluring about the private gyms. Like, oh, I make more per hour. Yeah, but you train so many less hours and you yes. have no clients. Yes. So zero, uh, 100% of zero is zero. I'd rather make 30% of 100%. Well, of and, when you, of and when you go out on your own, one of the first things you learn is the value, how much you would pay. Justin knows this. I remember when mm -hmm. he went out and built his business on the internet when that was still kind of a new thing. And how much do you, you pay for invest. leads? Yeah. How much money <laughs> do you have to spend to get 10 leads on the internet? Out. You got to shell out to do that. And when I just told you that an average big box gym sees 1,000 to 3,000 leads every day, that's free for yeah. you. So there is a, so that Dude. your cost of giving up half of your money to the big box gym worth is worth every penny not to mention, of leads. Okay. So you have like uh, an influx of clients, like your, your whole schedule's loaded. What you're learning is how to handle that. Yes. It, now imagine that you're off in this, this private gym and all of a sudden you get overwhelmed with clientele. You've never experienced that before. You're not going to provide them good service because you don't have the reps. No. So no. It, it's a, it's a great, and also by the way, some of these big box gyms, pay very well. I mean, I know UFC gym uh, now allows trainers to charge as much as they want. So technically you can make uh, quite a bit. Uh, so it's pretty amazing. And, you know, a lot of trainers become trainers in big box gyms, do a good job, and then realize that they actually prefer management and they prefer managing trainers. I know Adam was like that. Um, there's a lot of opportunities in the big, so it's, so definitely if you're going to get started, start in the big box. It's the best place. What is the best skill to learn fitness wise for a trainer? Okay. If when it comes to learning skills around programming, diet, health, et cetera, et cetera, 
the one thing that I learned that gave me the most return in terms of success, both with getting clients, keeping clients, getting referrals, just m building a bigger business in terms of what I saw in terms of my clients' quality of life improving, nothing came close to learning correctional exercise. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing came close. Gonna, diet doesn't come close. The same direction. Yeah, diet doesn't come close. You know, uh, yep. strength building, strength didn't come close. Stamina didn't Alleviating come close. Alleviating pain. If a correctional exercise was like, man, when I figured that out, I became so valuable, and I could see their quality of life dramatically improve just because I was able to do correctional exercise with them twice a week. Like I could solve many of their pain problems. By the way, you could also solve a pain problem or show somebody that you have the solution in a goal assessment, which you can't do with weight loss or muscle building. Someone comes in for a goal assessment, you show them some knee pain relief, the knee that's bothered them for 15 years, they're going to hire you. So there's nothing that, if you're gonna invest in a certification, or a course that's going to make you better in terms of your skills, like correctional exercise. I thought you were going to say sales uh, because so I. <laughs> because that would that would go right up there. Yeah. I would say because no, I'm talking like this is fitness wise, right? So yeah, no. Yeah. If if we're sticking to that, then I think we're all on the same page with yeah. this. It was the I I regret not doing my corrective exercise specialist certification earlier. Uh, it was way late in my career, yeah. and when I saw what it did um, for me with clients was. It was a game changer because I guess at that point in my career, I had not early on not realized that a majority of all my clients, regardless if they have a weight loss goal, a health goal, a building muscle goal, all of them, almost all of them had some sort of chronic pain or dysfunction that they wanted to alleviate, eliminate, improve. And I didn't have the tools. I didn't have the tools at that point in my career. That's not what my specialty. I knew how to count calories and mess with their macros and show them good exercise programming. I didn't have the tools for someone to walk in and be like, Adam, my hip hurts right here. How do you, can you help me? And then I, uh, you know, yeah. outsource Avoid that it. Exercise. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> I just didn't have, I didn't have the yeah. vocabulary. I didn't have the tools. And after I went through my corrective exercise specialist certification, I had that. And boy, did that uh, really build value in me as a coach and trainer. This also got me the most referrals. Uh, I yeah. learned a lot from shadowing mm -hmm. and working with a extremely talented physical therapist, which physical therapists are like the best when it comes to correctional exercise. And working alongside her and watching what she did, I picked up quite a bit and it brought me so many referrals because yeah. I didn't have, you know, clients would sometimes bring me people, oh, my friend wants to lose weight. My friend wants to get in shape for summer. But when they realized that I could help with pain, it was like, oh my God, my dad's neck hurts. Or I have a friend who just hurt her hip. Can you help her out? And they would bring me referrals left and right. Like the amount of value that that brought oh, me. It was funny. Everything. I felt like I was all alone because like all these trainers asked me, why they would always see me do these assessments with, with clients and potential clients, or I'd, you know, doing to kind of check up and see how things were progressing. But it was such a valuable tool and, and not just, not just obviously it's going to help them out in terms of alleviating pain and like improving their movement and strength. Uh, but two, it just reiterated my value and I, I didn't have to really sell myself anymore because they just knew what they were going to experience. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, by the way, what we're going to do, what we've been doing uh, for trainers now for a little while is we've been doing these, these, these webinars where we get on, it's live and we coach and teach trainers and, co and coaches. It's free. We're not charging anything at all. And it's always going to be free. And the reason why we're doing this is, is we love doing it. We love teaching trainers. We love teaching coaches. Uh, the next one coming up is on November 12th. That's at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And it's about how to retain clients during the holiday season. That's a challenge for a lot of trainers. Holidays come up, very, very difficult. They lose clients. How do you keep them consistent? So literally, if you're watching this when it airs, in two days, we have this webinar and Adam and I will be teaching it, but you have to sign up. You can go to Trainer Webinar. Dot com And again, it's for personal trainers and coaches, it's free. how to retain clients during the holiday season. And it's totally, totally free. All right. I know you liked that episode. If you did check this one out, 30% body fat for men. This is way too high. This is actually a bit high for women as well. So in today's episode, we're talking about how you can go from 30 to 10. What is 10% body fat? This is when you have a visible six pack. Can you go from 30 to 10%? Yes, it's possible but not if you guess along the way. So we're gonna talk about how you can do that in today's episode. Now there's a huge range, right? Of like body types. Yes. Some people can run uh, a little bit heavier uh, and, or a little bit higher body.